Now I request uh, Air Commander Jasjit Singh to give an inaugural address to the conference. President of uh, Manipal Trust, Pro Chancellor, Professor M. Kamath, ladies and gentlemen. Let me start off from where Professor Kamath left off. That at that time Germany was in total state of destruction. Today, the Prime Minister of India a few days ago told the Chancellor of Germany to help the other poorer country of Europe. The poorer countries were countries like Italy, France, and uh, Greece because of their heavy debts. So in a way, the world goes around in many, many ways. But they're simply going back to the period where Germany recovered from this disastrous situation of the war and its end to being one of the leading powers of the world, even although it does not sit amongst the three five, but German influence all around is very, very strong. Now, let's play the same thing. About the same time, India was partitioned. I recall this because I went to school in Lahore, and in those days, the general understanding in serious circles was that West Punjab was the granary of India. Because of the creation of Pakistan, India remained then deficient of food for the next 20 years because Pakistan had gone away. A lot of my younger friends will not perhaps be able to recall or read that Pakistan for the next 15 years had a higher per capita GDP than India. Pakistan was far more affluent than India was. And the political leadership of India did believe that these little differences like Kashmir and other things, and that's why in Jammu and Kashmir the army was stopped from going all out completely to the Western Front, that ultimately what will matter will be India-Pakistan relations. Unfortunately, Professor Kamat, unlike Germany, Pakistan is moving in the opposite direction. And the tragedy is that we, who would like to help Pakistan to come back to the track, to their future, after all, in every definition of international system, Pakistan would have been a major middle power today. And yet, it is destroying itself. This is the tragedy. And this tragedy is not just going to be played out within the borders of Pakistan, it's affecting its neighbors, Afghanistan on the other side, India on this side. So much so that the sole superpower is now got fed up and publicly are not talking about how the army and the RSI are actually promoting terrorism worldwide. It's a long way, it's 64 years. Now how the decline, and not only the decline, but the direction in which Pakistan has moved. Uh, so therefore, what is it that I would say in this inaugural session? Uh, one was to simply agree with Professor Kamath that a country can decide what route to adopt. For the last 30 years, I've been hearing that Pakistan is at a crossroad. It's still at a crossroad, except that one road has disappeared. So either it goes back and starts the journey again, which is actually not possible, or carry on from where it is going, which will be terrible for all of us. Uh, I'm talking even, if you only look at India's own interest and don't bother about Pakistan, but you can't, when you have an unstable, uh, self-destructing nation rapidly growing in size and everything else, you can't escape the consequences. Uh, so therefore, in a way, now to start this, this thing, let me just mention very briefly that the context in which I see this is that India is rising to great power status. Uh, it's going to be, it is in my judgment, 
one of the three major powers of the world today, the United States, China and India. And both China and the United and the United States pose us different type of challenges, complex from their own perspectives. They themselves are cooperating in many areas and unfortunately and now that the bilateral tension between the two is increasing. You see the latest uh, Pentagon's policy, not just the report, the policy that the Pacific, that United States is going to be an, a Pacific Ocean country, while the Chinese talk about anti-access. So there is not only an incipient but a real Cold War that is now emerging, which will be a different Cold War in nature from the Cold War that we've seen and lived through in the past. Both of these great powers support Pakistan with weapons, with money, with investments, economically and everything else, hoping that it will somehow survive and recover. Both of course have their own interest in mind. And therefore where does it leave India? One, which I want to put right up front, that over these 60 odd years, 64 years, given the level of dis differences and disputes and the wars, and above all, an increasing degree of mutual mistrust, uh, we have left ourselves no negotiating place to come to some sort of an understanding with Pakistan. That is assuming that Pakistan wants an understanding with India, which itself is questionable. Uh, and I'm looking at this from a purely objective perspective because many of us you might feel that as a former Air Force fighter pilot, I would have my biases against Pakistan. I, I, sir, I can assure you I have none. I fought the war. I was decorated for gallantry in the face of the enemy, but I had no hatred. I was doing my duty. I'm still doing my duty to try and understand Pakistan and try and explain it to my friends, colleagues, or whoever cares to listen. I said that the day I became director of IDSA in 1987, I still say that, that Pakistan's stability, Pakistan's integrity, and even Pakistan's strength militarily is in India's interest. And I get criticized for this very often because you can't have an unstable state with 160 million people in a deep state of poverty, the breeding ground of jihad, while you have 12% of our own population is Muslim. There are many linkages that still exist. And the 35 million Muslims in Pakistan, still called Muhajir, they have all relatives in this country. So that roots of relationship has not disappeared, fortunately. But they're going to be more difficult to maintain in future as a potential source of trying to come together. Pakistan itself poses, <coughs> when you want to look at pure Pakistan now into the future, it poses many complex challenges to itself, to its neighborhood, to the superpower. It should logically should be able to solve these problems. They have enough of money. They have spent uh, hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars in the last ten years in the war. The budget is still at six fifty billion dollars, but it's not for the simple reason that the Pakistan is at the brink of self-destruction. I want to say this again, that Pakistan is on the brink of self-destruction. Now, when you decided on self-destruction, if you decided to commit suicide, uh, it does give you <coughs> medically, clinically, some understanding of why somebody wants to do that. It also tells you that how much can you actually do if a man is ready to jump from the eighth floor and you are trying to hold it back somehow or the other. It, is, it has what it thought, evolved what we would call a Brahmastra. 
And what is Pakistan Brahmastra? Jihadi terrorism. As a state policy. Which they thought that, that through that process they can neutralize larger countries, India on one side, get the United States to pursue their goals and objectives rather than simply uh, tell Pakistan what to do, what not to do. Pakistan's economy is in a grim state. That growth rate which existed in the first 15, 16 years started to level off and from mid-1980s Pakistan is living on life support system intravenous with dollars on one side and the yuan from the other side. You find this amazing that the United States offers in spite of all the frustrations of keeps on offering more aid and that the Chinese go in to say we are investing 36 billion dollars to improve the industry. Will it? We hope so. Because in our interest. You talk to the Pakistani businessmen they want to. I remember having organized a seminar uh, when I was heading IDSA uh, in two, year 2000 on energy. And I invited Pakistani. A very fine gentleman came who was in business. Who actually his, his main thrust for those 25 minutes of presentation was that we need to import diesel from India. And there were difficulties from Pakistani side more than the Indian side. Those are the years, I don't know what is happening now, perhaps Ms. Tarakan can, can brief me quietly over a cup of tea, but the Indian, in, through the 80s and 90s, the Indian ties for buses and trucks used to be transported via Vladivostok through Siberia, Central Asia, and down to Pakistan, because they were better than what they could get from the West. But that also created, in the last 40 years or 50 years, vested interests who have no interest in trying to do trade with India. There are signs of this, we see this in the last few days, that not only the MFN status, but more substantively, that trade might improve. And this time, at least they're saying that the army is on board. Uh, strange thing that in the modern world in the 21st century the cabinet ministers of Pakistan have to say that on trade with India the army is on board. You can then understand the amount of cloud power it, it is used and misused and abused by the Pakistan army. The trouble, therefore, is that Pakistan cannot be a normal state unless the Pakistan army becomes a normal army. Go back to the barracks. But we've seen here that what the United States called the number one enemy, Osama bin Laden, for nearly six years was living in the middle of the most important cantonment of the Pakistan army. About 600 meters from the military academy of it's amazing that how it's a I won't even say duality of policy but multiplicity of policy that you keep creating groups, jihadi groups some, for some you use them for your purpose some for other purposes there are serious imbalances in the society of Pakistan which is still remain medieval there were efforts to try and impose some sort of land sealing to try and equalize things. But uh, just in case somebody wants to know the facts, for a lieutenant general, the ceiling is 1,000 acres of irrigated land. 